Thanks, everyone. I, I, I like the long networking breaks. It gives everybody an opportunity to really collaborate. So our next presentation, we had um, a similar presentation during our internal oversight workshop training earlier this year. And we had we had the opportunity to hear something similar to this presentation from Curtis Holland, who's the senior reliability specialist, and James Hansen, the manager of operations analysis, about the history of the cold weather events and their impact on the BPS. And this really is going to highlight the need for the enforceable standards that Allison covered this morning. So even though I've been following this standard for a really long time and I've been following these events for a really long time, I learned a tremendous amount during that presentation and I think that you will also learn um, a lot today. So help me in welcoming the, present the presenters. Thank you, Deb. Um, as you said, my name is Curtis Holland. I'm a senior reliability specialist in the event analysis department here at WEC. So I'm not in the compliance side. Um, we heard a lot today about cold weather standards, those that are coming up, those that are in place. What we're hoping to do now is with this presentation is open a small window into a, just a wealth of information that NERC has on their website on past cold weather standards. Uh, not standards, but past cold weather events and what occurred during those events and how we got to the point where we actually need and have cold weather standards. So we're going to look at the history of uh, cold weather impacts on the BPS. We're going to understand the need for the urgency and the necessity of the cold weather reliability standards that are coming in place. Uh, this is a picture from the Eastern Interconnection. This is South Dakota, a uh, blizzard in 1966. That's a DOT employee standing by the power line. So the snow got a little bit high there. And uh, if we look at the cold weather events, we can see that a lot of them seem to happen in the Eastern interconnection, but that doesn't mean that the Western interconnection isn't also susceptible to cold weather events. So we're gonna talk about you know, what is an extreme cold weather event. It's a term that's thrown around a lot. We're gonna look at cold weather in the Western interconnection specifically, and we're gonna look at some historic cold weather events that NERC has on their website. So the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency uh, had this definition of extreme cold weather. So it's gonna be cold weather temperatures that are lower than historical averages. And these are low enough that they start doing damage. They can injure people, they can injure animals, they can take equipment out of service. And they also indicate that this can vary across the country. As we know, they're even within WEC, the Northern states are typically winter peaking. The summer areas are typically summer peaking. And so we see the variation even across our own footprint. So if we look at the average winter temperatures in the states that compose WEC, we have a couple of lows. 21.2 is an average low in the wintertime for Montana and Wyoming. California, 46.2, that's their average winter temperature. But if we look at cold weather extremes in the West, Montana, minus 70 degrees. Our high at Arizona, minus 40 degrees. All of the other states, had a cold temperature somewhere in between those two over the course of it. So even in the West, depending on where you're at in what state, you have different cold weather, different temperatures that uh, the state is susceptible for reaching. So when we look at cold weather events that are on the NERC website, what we see is they've got records of about 16 different events that occurred over the last 40 years. Of those 16 events, 12 of them occurred within the last 20 years. We're gonna talk a little bit today about just the last five events. But we can see that with all of these events that occurred, they did an investigation. They came up with reasons why it occurred. They came up with recommendations, why or things to take care of that might help. But uh, we still have events occurring and without some sort of intervention like cold weather standards, the next event really is a matter of when rather than if. So, we look at an event comparison of just the last five. So we're talking 2011 up to current time, and we're gonna focus on causes of unavailable generation because that's really a big driver that we saw during these events. And what we see, the commonality, we have freezing issues, mechanical, electrical issues, and we have natural gas issues that show up in almost every event in one form or another. So when these events come into an area, they're not unexpected. The weather forecasts come in, 
We expected the weather that came in in January of 2024 to hit the area. When the entities get this weather forecast that there's an event coming into the area, what they're going to do is they're going to start making forecasts. They're going to say, okay, we got weather forecasts coming in that are lower than normal. What is our load going to look like? And they're going to try to forecast that load. And then they're going to say, well, what is our generation going to look like? Are we going to lose more generation than normal? And the reason they do all this forecasting is that when the cold weather arrives, when they hit the real time operating window, they're wanting to balance the amount of generation they have to the amount of load that they're going to serve with a little extra reserve in case you, know, you lose a generation here or there. So that during that real time window, the system operators, the RCs, the balancing authorities, the TOPs can operate the system in a reliable manner. And what we're going to see in the events we look at is that that balance between that generation and load is uh, skewed. Sometimes it's a mis, uh, miscalculation on forecasts that they did. Sometimes it's just loss of uh, generation. So here's a quote that uh, some say was by Ben Franklin. No conclusive evidence of that. By failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. When we look at the 2011 event, which is the first one that we're going to look at, Going into that event, neither ERCOT nor any of the other entities thought that they were going to have a problem meeting their customer demand. They all had adequate reserves. So they did their due diligence, they did their forecasts, they looked at it, they said, we have enough generation to serve our load and we have enough reserves to cover any contingencies that may happen. Unfortunately, that isn't what occurred and we end up with the 2011 Southwest cold weather event. Now, this event, one of the characteristics of this one is it's the first cold weather inquiry that FERC actually participated in. And when they participated, they had a couple of different goals. They wanted to identify the causes of the disruptions. So what's causing these cold weather problems that we're having? And they wanted to look at appropriate actions to prevent reoccurrence. So how do we fix it? Um, when we look at the 2011 event, we can see that not only did it impact ERCOT, which is Texas, but it also impacted a couple entities within the Western Interconnection. When we look at that impact, ERCOT lost 210 individual generating units. They were an outage, a do rate or fail to start, as we saw in our kind of a comparison. And they shed 4,000 megawatts of load. So when system operators are operating the power system in real time, their goal is to maintain the power system in a reliable operating state. It's not to keep the lights on for everybody if that's not what works out. Ideally, everybody's lights are on, everybody has the power they need in real time operating condition. If you don't have a balance between your load and generation, then one of the two has to go. If you don't have generation you can bring on, then you have to take load off. Salt River project, 1050 megawatts of generation, 300 megawatts of load. El Paso Electric, 646 megawatts of generation, 1,000 megawatts of rotating load shed. About 1.3 million people were impacted by this event as they uh, went through the course of it. When they looked at the event report, they did their investigation, and there's a ton of information on the 2011 event out there. But what they recognized was many of the generators failed to adequately apply and institutionalize knowledge and recommendations from previous severe weather events. So they didn't look at lessons from the past and apply them to their system. Over 29,000 megawatts of generation that was committed in the day ahead market either tripped, derated, or failed to start. So when they were forecasting the generation that was going to be forced out of service, they didn't forecast enough. They lost more generation than they anticipated to. And that led to that load generation imbalance. And also what, what we heard earlier, one of the primary critical loads that they're looking at is including natural gas facilities. In this particular case, when they were doing their rotating load sheds, they were impacting the electrical supply to the natural gas. And that electrical supply, because it wasn't identified as a critical load, ended up uh, impacting the natural gas supplies to the gas generators. Um, this is a Quote on the recommendations not followed. So the Public uh, Utility Council of Texas in the 1989 event looked at it and made some recommendations on some of the changes. In the 2011 event, the uh, failures that they saw resulted from some of the same type of equipment. And unfortunately, by some of the same generators that were affected in the 1989 event. So 
they also identified that gas electric interdependency, that tripping of the electrical supply to the gas load. And they wanted to look at, okay, how severe was it in this particular instance? What they noticed was the rolling blackouts from the different utilities that were doing that, ERCOT in particular for this particular part, caused a significant cause from 29 to 27% of production shortfalls in what the Permian and Fort Worth basins. So natural gas is subject to its own freezing issues, freezing at the wellheads that can curtail some of the, the uh, gas that's produced. But in this particular case, they're identifying significant causes in the curtailment of natural gas due to the loss of the electricity supply during the blackouts, simply because it wasn't identified. In some of the cases, the uh, natural gas company wasn't sure where the electricity came from as far as lines or companies, and the utilities didn't have it on their record that they were serving natural gas supplies. And so the flip side of that, once your natural gas supply starts going down, you start having gas shortfalls to the generation that you're shedding load because you don't already don't have enough of. And this is something that we see as we looked at that comparison chart when we went across all five of the events, all five of them had natural gas impact issues. And it was the same type of issue in each one. So the 2011 event also had some training materials and some examples. This is some examples. This is a gap in insulation. When you're talking about critical sensing lines to power generators, especially any small gap in that insulation that can allow that cold weather to get in, you get that one blockage of ice that blocks that control line and you can adversely impact the ability of that generator to produce the power. The other one over there, exposed valves. So they have thermal insulation there, but it's not covering all of the equipment. Um, this one here, the frozen valves, that talks more to kind of what we might see here in WEC in the southern areas. We're designing the power plants to operate during the heat of the summer because that's when our peak is. And so in the wintertime, they put insulating blankets over the valves to make sure that they're okay, but they didn't, uh, they took them off during the summertime and didn't replace them. And then when the cold weather moved in, we have broken valves. And the low wind break, it was mentioned earlier today about the wind speed and uh, generation tripping below their rated temperatures. That's gonna be a wind speed issue. In this particular case, they're talking about a wind break. It's there to stop that wind from blowing on some of the equipment, but in this case, it was too low to be effective. In the 2011 event, they had 26 electrical recommendations and six gas recommendations. Uh, the thing to note on the 2011 event is with all of these recommendations and FERC participation, there were no recommendations for reliability standards to deal with any of the problems that they saw. Three years later, the 2014 polar vortex. So this one moved in in January. This is largely gonna be an Eastern interconnection one, Midwest, South, Central, East Coast regions. The uh, temperatures 20 to 30 degrees below that average. So we're getting down into our extreme cold weather temperatures here. And if we look at the cold weather, the top line is the average high and low winter temperatures for the areas that were affected. As we move into January 5th of this, we can see it's getting kind of cold in the Minneapolis area. Temperatures are starting to drop across the area. January 6th, we can see temperature drops further getting into the area. January 7th, an interesting thing about that one, eight of the nine different entities had high temperatures in that day that were lower than their average low temperatures for the winter. And then we see it starting to crawl out on January 8th. So another aspect of these cold weather events that we see often is peak record winter loads. So the, in this particular case, we can see there's nine, excuse me, eight different peaks that were set during the course of this event. And that's just, you know, the electric load being served by these utilities is a, uh, had peaked during that particular time. We're seeing more of this, I think, perhaps as part of the electrification of the power system. As you put in things like heat pumps, once the temperature drops below the heat pump's ability to function as a heat pump, it goes to resistive heating, kicks up the electricity usage, and balancing authorities need to be aware of that in their footprint to accurately predict their loads. If we look at generator outages by fuel type in the 2014 event, we can see that most of the fuel type is gonna be natural gas and it's gonna be coal. That's the capacity. If we look at the impact, 55% of the forced outages were natural gas, 26% were coal. So the thermal generation is really getting hit hard by these type of events, and that's the cold weather impacts and what they have on the mechanical equipment and on the fuel supplies. Some of the observations they made from this one, generation facilities made improvements in their winter preparation, so it's a positive one. They identified proactive communication and coordination between RCs and within the RC areas as they operate the system during these, 
these uh, major events. But they also identified that planned and forced generation outages in some regions exceeded the worst case assumptions used in seasonal assessments. So the BAs had their winter seasonal assessments. They have an idea of how much generation is going to be scheduled out of service, how much generation certain cold temperatures that they forecast are going to force out of service. In this particular case, because more generation was forced out of service by the cold weather than they predicted, they didn't have enough generation to serve the necessary load. Recommendations, 10 recommendations were made for this event. They were going to look at that natural gas supply issues that were encountered during the event. They were going to go ahead and look at the plant power plant weatherization programs. They were going to look at site reviews of generation facilities, winter preparation. All of these may sound similar to some of the standards that are in place or coming up. They're going to look at improving awareness of pipeline system conditions because what they recognized in the gas electric interdependency is there wasn't a lot of communications or understanding between the two. Electricity, you flip a switch, it's there, it's on, it's automatic. Gas pipelines, you have to pump the gas in, you have to build up the pressure, it has to transfer across you know, miles or maybe hundreds of miles of lines, and that takes time. And if you start drawing out more gas because you need the generation than you're putting into the pipeline, then you start depleting that, that uh, supply. And they also wanted to identify and protect for outages that occurred within the cold weather design basis of the plant. So those are the ones that might be that wind chill there looking at, okay, these tripped at a higher temperature than what they were rated for and what's going on with that. So four years later, 2018, South Central US weather event. Before I get into that one, 2015, what happened in 2015? There was a polar vortex moved down into about the same area as the 2014 one. Well, we don't show 2015 on here because it really didn't have an adverse effect. NERC did a winter review of the 2015 event. There were cold weather uh, load temperature records set as far as serving load. There were similar cold temperatures to the 2014. But what they identified in that review was that the the BAs and the generator sources did a more proactive approach. They manned some of the stations to make sure that they were available. They brought generation on earlier. They kept it online so it stayed warm. So they, they learned from the lessons of 2014 and were able to apply that in 2015. And so they rode through it, maybe very similar to what happened in early 2024 with uh, winter storms, uh, what is it, Jerry and uh, Heather. So, um, 2018 South Central U.S. cold weather event. So forecast several days in advance, just like the other ones. They had time. They knew it was coming in. Uh, it was going to last for several days. Minimum temperatures that again at 12 to 28 degrees below normal, getting down into our extreme cold weather temperature range. In this one, they put a map out of the generator outages. You can see several thousand megawatts of generation lost due to this event throughout the. Uh, the territory that was affected. One of the other things they identified during the operation of the power system, um, as the generation that's serving load is lost, then you have to get power from somewhere else. And if that power comes from a generator that's remote or it comes from another balancing authority beside you, then it has to travel across the power system. When it travels across the power system, what they noticed in this one here is you started seeing transmission constraint issues. So the operators are running their real-time contingency analysis. They're seeing all of these constraint issues, and they're trying to take action. So what actions do you take? Well, maybe you move generation from one place to another to try to do that. Maybe you reconfigure transmission, whatever they did. But it was identified in this particular one that transmission constraint issues did play a part in this event. Some of the findings they found for the 2018 event. Uh, caused by a failure to properly prepare or winterize generation facilities to cold temperatures. Gas supply issues contributed to the event. And uh, natural gas fired units represented at least 70% of the unplanned outages and D rates. And then that transfer of power from distant generation. So they had an N minus what they call many, meaning their, their contingency analysis had many different contingencies identified during the course of this event, which caused the system operators to have to take or try to take actions to mitigate those different events. And then they identified a uh, forecasting, three to five out of the load forecast for MISO South were lower than the peak load for January 17th. So the load forecast that the uh, entity did in this particular case didn't match the load that they saw during the event. So they'd under forecast for this particular event. 
and that there was lower than 17. So some of the recommendations they did, 13 recommendations for this report of note, development and enhancement of NERC reliability standards. So 2018, after the years of different recommendations for cold weather um, mitigation measures to be put in place, it finally gets to the point where cold weather standards have been identified to be the solution for the problem that we're seeing. In 2023, these cold weather standards that were part of the 2018 event recommendation became standards, EOP 11-2, TOP 3-5, and IRO 10-4. So a long period of time was kind of talked about time frame today, especially talking about IBRs. How long is it gonna to take to get these standards in place? In this particular case, many, many years before standards were put in place for the cold weather. And another recommendation, recommendation nine, talks about the transmission owners and operators should conduct an analysis that delineates different summer and winter ratings for both normal and emergency conditions. So we know that FERC put out order 881 talking about ambient adjusted ratings. Um, it was identified in this event and in others that congestion across the transmission system may have been caused by the fact that they were using static winter ratings rather than dynamic winter ratings, and entities that were using more dynamic winter ratings were able to allow more power to flow than those that weren't. So three years later, 2021, cold weather outages in Texas and South Central U.S. So one thing to think about when you think about Texas, they're an interconnection of their own. They have about 1,220 megawatts of DC ties into their system from Mexico and the Eastern Interconnection. It's a little bit of generation that can switch between tying to the Eastern Interconnection and tying to Texas that was used in this particular event, but uh, largely it impacted Texas, a little bit of the South Central US. So as temperatures dropped, more and more generating units throughout Texas failed in their gut. When we look at it, freezing issues, 44% of the loss, fuel issues, 31% of the loss, mechanical electrical issues, 21% of the loss. And then transmission and other, a little smitter over there and 2% on each of those. So 1,045 megawatt, or excuse me, 1,045 generating units ended up having 4,124 different outages. So a generating unit went out, came back into service, tripped out again, which is why there's more outages than there were units that were impacted. Many of these were wind generation. Obviously, there's more, there was a lot of thermal generation also. So we're looking at a snapshot here of the frequency in the ERCOT interconnection over a 45 minute period. So we can see we start out there at 1.20 in the morning. We're about 59.5 um, hertz going into the system. So ERCOT enters an EEA3, they shed 1,000 megawatts of load. This is that rotating load shed starting in ERCOT. Frequency climbs above 60, but then as more generation is lost, we see the frequency start to decline and more rapidly decline. They order a 2,000 megawatts, excuse me, another 1,000 megawatts of load shed as the frequency continues to decline. They get below a critical point for ERCOT, which is at 59.4 hertz. At 59.4 hertz, they start a nine minute timer on a protection system in ERCOT. If that nine minute timer runs out, it trips off more generation. So in order to prevent that from happening, system operators call for 3,000 megawatts of load shed. A few minutes later, they call for an additional 3,500 megawatts of load shed. So still within our 45 minute period, we went from zero load shed to now 8,500 megawatts. And on, in this particular one, as they're doing the load shed from the first 3,000 megawatts that were ordered, they were ordered to shed additional load. So the operators out there in the field, the distribution, um, operators, they're shedding load as fast as they can to try to accommodate this. We can see the frequency discover, or start to recover. They were under that 59.4 for about 4 minutes and 23 seconds. As the frequency is recovering, more generation is lost. You can see the dips that go down on that frequency, and they order another 2,000 megawatts of load shed. So in this particular 45-minute period, they went from 0 megawatts to 10,500 megawatts of load shed. Over the course of this event, ERCOT would eventually shed 20,000 megawatts of load. The largest load loss from load shed in the country and rivaled only by blackout conditions that have occurred in different areas of the country. So natural gas facilities, again, they were impacted by the event, freezing temperatures and weather conditions. So 
There are production facilities, again, the wellheads at the production facilities, they're affected by this natural gas, but there's also other issues. And in this particular case, some of the natural gas facilities were also still part of the load shed and they were impacted by that load shed and tripping of the uh, natural gas facilities impacted the ability to use that natural gas for generation. And also prioritizing natural gas for, you know, as should be for people first before generation was a cause or an impact in this particular event. What did they have for findings? Despite several prior recommendations, 49 generation units in SPP, 26 in ERCOT, three in MISO South still did not have any winterization plans. And 81% uh, of the freeze related generating outages occurred at temperatures above the units stated ambient design temperature. So we're still tripping above the design temperature. We're still having, you know, prior recommendations not being followed. And uh, in this particular one, 28 recommendations were made. FERC and NERC set up a, a means to track the implementation of these recommendations. These were all talked about coming up in the, uh, the new standards that are coming in place. EOP 12-1, effective October 1st. EOP 12-2, maybe, maybe not. There's a little bit of kickback on that one. Uh, we know that EOP 11-4 and EOP top 2 dash five are also coming at the one at October of this year, one at October of next year. So more recommendations in this particular case for cold weather reliability standards. And then winter of 2022, Winter Storm Elliott. So Winter Storm Elliott was really kind of a study in an area that just plainly ran out of generation resources. So 1,702 individual generating units tripped, 3,565 unplanned outages, derates, or failures to start. As generating units started tripping in some of the areas during Winter Storm Elliott, they followed their emergency procedures. They did their EEA-1s, their EEA-2s. Eventually, they got to EEA-3s, and they started looking towards their neighbors to get emergency power. And so those neighbors that had emergency power available started supplying that power to the individuals that were having the problems, at least the, the ones that started losing the generation first. There were 90,500 megawatts of generation loss during this event. So out of that, 96% of them, 31% freezing issues, 24% fuel issues, 41% mechanical electrical issues, and natural gas impact. So we see here on the left, this is the natural gas pipeline. As the pressure drops on that pipeline, they enter an emergency condition. You can see on the right, 19,000 megawatts of natural gas fire generation lost to fuel issues in just a 24 hour period. So definitely uh, there was freezing at the wellheads and stuff during this event, but the natural gas usage and the natural gas impact also significantly affected generation in this event. As those areas that were capable of supplying emergency power to the, uh, the first ones that lost started losing generation, their ability to supply that emergency power ceased. And so they ended up cutting the schedules for the emergency power, going to the different entities. Once those schedules were cut, many of those entities entered the EEA-3 and started rotating load shed. So this is uh, CityGate going in from Con Edison, and that's just kind of where the the uh, gas is delivered to the distribution system. In this particular case, case, their pressure started crashing and they ended up having to take liquid natural gas resources and inject them into the pipeline to try and hold that pressure up. So Con Edison during this investigation said, had this collapsed into that city gate, it would have taken months to restore all of that gas to all of the individuals because they have to send people out individually to light the individual um, fire, the individual pilot lights at the different places. And they said, even with mutual help, it would have taken months to restore this. Fortunately, they were able to recover the pressure and this didn't occur. Black start generators. So black start generators are those generators that are capable of starting without having any power source from the power system. During an emergency, like maybe a winter storm moving into your area where you're losing a lot of generation and you run the risk of having a blackout, you want to have blackout resources. It's an integral part of a system operator's restoration plan. 
In this particular case, 19,000 megawatts of those black SART resources were forced outages, derates, or failures to start. And this is in the Eastern Connection. They also identified blackout, uh, black SART generators as being an impact in ERCOT. And one of the things that ERCOT then did after the 2021 event is they went through and they did a, uh, a survey or an investigation into the black start. Why did they trip? Why weren't they there when we needed them? Because if you black out and you don't have the generators that you're depending on to restart your system, then you're in an even worse place than you would with just a blackout itself. Mechanical electrical issues. So nearly 80% occurred at ambient temperatures that were above the documented operating temperatures of the equipment. So we're seeing that again, um, that above that operating temperature, which I think is part of the focus on why we're trying to find out what's the temperature that these generators can operate at so that the system operators, when they go into this real-time operating window, have a pretty good idea, or at least the best they can, of what they're dealing with. Uh, they were above the documented minimal operating temperatures, Natural gas fuel issues, 10,038 megawatts were due to firm natural gas transportation curtailments. So that was that uh, gas electric interdependency. Uh, the equipment from the shippers were affected by freezing issues and mechanical issues. And then the majority of the DA's short range forecasts. So they saw forecasting errors in this particular one also. Um, they underestimated the load going into the event. Um, they used different means in different uh, balancing areas to forecast that load, some better than others in this particular case. One of them had underestimated their load by 11.6%. And again, if you're planning to have generation in place and re reserves in place for what you expect to be the load that you're going to have, and 11.6% more, more load shows up on your doorstep, you may have a problem. Two of them underestimated at least 5% for their day ahead forecast for December 24th. So as you get closer to that real time operating window, your forecasts get better. But even with better forecasts, the day ahead, they were 5% off on what they expected to show up as the load for that particular day. Recommendations from the 2022 report, no new NERC reliability standards were recommended as part of this report. Uh, it did contain 11 different recommendations. They aimed at addressing the recurrence of the generating unit outages and natural gas infrastructure. And what they talked about was the effective implementation of the 2021 Winter Storm URI report um, reliability standard recommendations. So they felt in 2022, they didn't need another NERC standard recommendation. Just look back at 2021, effectively put all of those standards in place and that would take care of the issues that we saw in 2022. Winter Storm Elliott 1B recommendation. They talked about identify generating units at the highest risk during extreme cold weather, perform cold weather verifications, and verify that. Um, that is not my presentation. There was supposed to be another slide there. Sorry, James. I was gonna say that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the slide that should have been there that isn't is everything I talked about, every Data piece of data that you saw there is on the NERC website. There are huge amounts of information on all of these events. In the 2011 event, they had 13 different lessons learned from that event. They had a sheet where they went in and they applied cause codes to the event and talked about those. They had uh, developed training material from which the pictures came from, talking about you know different aspects of it. So if you haven't had an opportunity or if you just want to refresh on it, all of that information is on the NERC website and more. And like I said, this is just a small window opening up into this type of event to say, why do we have reliability standards? Because every few years, we're seeing these events come in place. Every few years, part of the problem that comes by is recommendations hadn't been being followed. And so in order to get a reliable means to deal with this, reliability standards were and are being developed. Thanks. Didn't want to steal your thunder, James. Just share that one right there. Very good. All right. Well, thank you for having us today. Um, I was telling, I was telling Curtis that. Um, 
when we when we originally were were asked to give this presentation the workshop we were before lunch and i told them the only thing worse than being between an audience and lunch is being between an audience and happy hour and i mean <laughs> schedules got switched around and here we are but that was a great walk through curtis i really appreciate that and um it is, it is no wonder why cold weather shows up as one of the top risks to BES reliability after, after hearing that walkthrough. Um, Curtis ended on winter storm Elliot and talked about some of the recommendations that, that came from that report. And those recommendations, some of them went to generator owners and operators. Some of them went to NERC and some to the regional entities as well. Recommendation 1B. Um, yeah, let me see. There we go. So recommendation 1B was for NERC and the regional entities to perform an evaluation of the generation fleet in the different regions throughout the nation. And uh, this was this was to be done using information available to us and identifying some uh, potentially risky generators and to reach out and to have conversations with those to, to make sure that we felt comfortable with their readiness approach. So um, this, this report was published late October. If you look at the deadline there for identification of the sites, it was by the end of the year. So we were working on a tight time frame, and uh, we started working on this uh, within days of this report getting published. Um, the uh, WEC and NERC worked really well together, and that was no exception in, in this case right here. Uh, because WEC be was more familiar with, with our entities, and with the challenges that we face here in the Western interconnection, we took the lead on the analysis and the determination of the different sites and entities that we wanted to have, wanted to involve in recommendation 1B. And uh, some of the data sets that, that we looked at, some of it was just more general. Um, taking a look at generator location, geographically, where are they? capacity, what's their impact, fuel type, and their susceptibility to fuel constraints. We also took a look at, we also used the, uh, the information provided from the NERC alert that came out in 2023. Uh, we also looked within the GADS database, um, generator availabilities. Uh, we looked for D rates. We looked for outages based on cold and freezing conditions. So those were those were some of the criteria that the team used to determine who we want to have these conversations with. Another thing that we did internally was we did not just assign this to one department and say go forth and and do. We created a team, a cross departmental team within WEC, and. Uh, we did this based on expertise. So you can see that we had expert, we had uh, participation from entity monitoring, from our risk team, from our oversight planning, as well as our operations analysis team. We were able to work together um, also with uh, NERC representation. And uh, I feel like the, the team did, worked really well together. As we, as we identified the plants and as we had our team identified, uh, we started developing topics and questions that we wanted to, to ask about these generation sites. So one of the criteria was uh, we identified a number of plants that still had incomplete essential actions that were identified in NERC alerts. We wanted to pull on that thread a little bit. We wanted to know what was causing those sites, those essential actions to be incomplete? Was it um, supply chain delays? Were we dealing with capital and time intensive projects? Uh, was it poor planning by 
by the entity themselves. We just needed more information. We knew that those essential actions were incomplete. What was leading to that? Um, we we wanted to to know what was included within cold weather processes and procedures. Also asking um, how long have these procedures been in place? Who's responsible for their upkeep and uh, updating them? And how frequently are they updated as well? We had similar questions related to the maintenance and training uh, of those sites as well. We another criteria that we used was we selected some plants that had some outages due that experienced some outages due to cold weather um, and freezing conditions. And uh, the purpose behind that is was really not to know the cause, although we did ask that question. We really wanted to know what did that entity learn from from having that event on their system and what did they do to put themselves in a better position when they experience cold weather again. Uh, the final question that we asked on those was how did you disseminate that information to other generators within your fleet? So uh, we we also selected some sites that were uh, that had ECWTs above 32 degrees. We uh, Curtis showed in his presentation that even in parts of the interconnection that are generally mild, they can still see cold temperatures. And it's when we are seeing those cold temperatures that we need those generators producing power. So we needed to make sure that we were confident in the approaches that they were taking. Also, we wanted to know how freeze protection measures were being monitored. Having heat trace is, that's great, having those circuits in place, but what if something happens? You need to be able to notify your operations that that measure is no longer in place. So those were the type of topics that we had um, that we wanted to touch on. So we, uh, we, we we're at the point now where we have the questions developed we have our team, and guess what? It's middle of December, perfect timing, right? Um, we we had we had webinar calls with with all of our entities. We knew it was not the opportune time, but at the same time, we we felt it was necessary to to have that to hold those calls. Uh, we we gave about five weeks to be able to. Um, to be able to respond to the request for information that we that we sent uh, these questions out on. During these webinars, we, we explained the overall purpose. We explained the selection process that we went through, and we also reviewed the questions. We wanted to make sure it, they were clear in our minds, but you know that's always the case when you're the ones writing writing the questions. So we wanted to make sure that that they were clear for all of the entities that we were asking to respond to these questions. Um, like I said, uh, we made ourselves, uh, we, we, we provided that in, in mid-December, but the team made themselves available to uh, answer questions and to help the entities out when they needed, when they needed assistance. So, Happy to say that all of the entities responded within the requested time frame. Uh, once we received those questions in, our team started diving into the responses. And we were looking for a few key things. Um, we were looking for uh, responses that, that we still had some, some questions on. We needed a little bit more detail on, the, um, on those responses. We were also looking for standout responses, whether areas of strength or areas where we felt improvement could, could be uh, incorporated. So after identifying those items, we held follow-up calls with each of the entities. And at, at this time, I, I wanted, I know I've, I've talked with some of you out, out here already. I wanna say thanks to you and your teams we had really open and honest conversations during these follow-up calls. 
They, they provided the details that we were really looking for. And uh, we know that everyone is super busy at this time, and we appreciate your team taking time out to meet with us, provide us that detail, and to give us that assurance that those sites are um, are ready for cold weather temperatures when it when it shows. Also, during uh, during this this uh, part of the process, we also identified if uh, on-site visits were necessary. Uh, Per, per site. So this is the stage where we're at right now. This is feedback from uh, from the effort. We're taking a two prong approach here. Um, first, we, we are providing individual feedback forms to each of the entities that that participated. We'll provide some um, some uh, general information in that feedback form, but then specific areas of strength that stood out to us, as well as opportunities for improvement. Um, we also are going to be, be, be providing information in general sessions. Uh, one of those is going to be uh, a webinar that, that NERC is going to be announcing soon. We've already provided our feedback for that webinar. Um, we'll make sure that we, uh, we announce that in the WEC weekly email so, uh, and, and also distribute it um, so that you can uh, tune into that that webinar and and hear on a national level the different uh, things that were identified during during this effort because WEC was doing it at the same time that all the other regions were doing it as well. Uh, there's also some outreach in our committee structures that we we've already identified. Um, we'll be providing some. Um, some information to the in the summer re reliability and risk committee will also be um, holding a, a winter preparedness webinar in Q3 that will be um, supported by our generator operator forum and we'll be providing some insights from this this effort as well. We don't want to limit to that though. Uh, if there is a, if there's an opportunity for this information to be beneficial. Uh, we're open to sharing this in any any other setting that you see um, fits. So, as we talk about feedback, I wanted to give um, some general takeaways from from this work that we've been doing. And one of the first things that I want to say is that entities within the Western interconnection are paying attention to what's happening in other parts of the country. Uh, we we saw a lot of pride in the work that was being done within some of the entities that that we spoke with, and uh, a lot of uh, intentional action in in mitigating cold weather risk in their sites. So uh, big kudos to to all the work that's that's going on right there. We we spoke with several entities that had made recent updates to seasonal training. And those updates were due to recent events as well as industry lessons learned that have been published. So using the information available, industry information available to you to augment those that training that's taking place. We saw similar, uh, we saw similar um, maintenance program uh, improvements where um, where best practices were being incorporated and and a reevaluation at a regular basis to make sure that best practices were being incorporated into those maintenance processes or maintenance programs. Uh, we we spoke with entities with good internal controls. We spoke with entities that had good communication between relevant departments within the plant. Uh, so nobody was operating in a silo. Um, and we spoke with entities with mature uh, monitoring and alarming processes for their freeze protection measures. So all in all, I think uh, it was a, a positive effort and we got a lot of really good information from that. So um, all of the efforts that I've been talking about have dealt with recommendation 1B of the Elliott report. And as we're kind of winding down that effort, 
this internal team within WEC has been asking, um, where do we go from here? Especially if you look at recommendation 1C of that same report where regional entities are being asked to perform targeted cold weather verification on a risk based approach. So, um, this is this has been an internal conversation within the team. I've shared it with my my vice president of RAPA, but we've talked about the establishment of a of a risk based um, readiness generator readiness program. Um, this would be different than the of course the, uh, the mandatory standards that would be in place. Uh, we we know that there are other regions that have such programs in place. There's a lot of benefit that comes from those. You get insights, you, you um, better understand the challenges that entities are facing uh, when it comes to winterizing and, prepare, and, and preparing their site for extreme weather. So uh, definitely more to come on that one as it materializes, if it materializes, but that's, a, that's been an internal thought from that, from that team on how we address recommendation 1C. So that really takes me through the, my part of the presentation. That was the slide Curtis was looking for right there. It got moved to the end. Boss. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. But we wanted to make that, we wanted to make these references available to you because we know the slide deck will be, will be available. Uh, an immense amount of, information is available from these sites, uh, hundreds of hours of work. Take advantage of this. You're learning from other people's events. Um, augment your programs so that you don't have to be going through these type of events on your system. So at this time, I'd, I'd like to open it up for questions uh, with the caveat that I am in RAPA and I, so uh, I'm probably not the best one to answer compliance questions, but uh, shoot. I'll make up answers. <laughs> While the audience is thinking about their questions, we did get one online. Okay. It looks like natural gas impact is substantial during these winter events. What coordination, if any, is NERC or FERC doing with the natural gas industry to help avoid natural gas shortages during future extreme cold weather events? So during the, uh, especially the winter storm Elliot and the winter storm URI events, um, some of the things that NERC and FERC are doing, of course, it's the standards that come in there that talk about making sure that the companies identify these critical natural gas loads on any type of load shed and exclude them from the load shed process so that they don't cut the power going to these pipeline facilities. The other thing they're looking at is a recommendation to possibly set up a NERC type of oversight to the gas system, similar to what NERC has with the electrical system. Uh, it is not something that would be under NERC's jurisdiction because they do not have jurisdiction of natural gas system but it could be under FERC's jurisdiction. So they are looking at doing that. And the other thing they talk about extensively is they're looking at trying to enhance just the communication that exists today between the uh, electrical industry and the natural gas industry as far as you know, during events like this or even leading up to them, the communications between them can be improved. And many of the, the uh, events that we saw, there are some balancing areas throughout the uh, United States that do an excellent job of coordinating with the natural gas facilities in their areas, uh, mainly because they're largely dependent on that natural gas to serve their load. Um, so those are recommendations for the entire, because it's not isolated to those that are just, you know, serving the uh, load with their natural gas. What we're seeing with the change in generation resources to IBRs is that it's balancing Many people are putting in also some natural gas plants to try and balance the variable resource uh, capabilities of the IBRs that are coming in place. So gas is going to be part of the mix for a while. And it's just a matter of, you know, fixing the coordination issues that have been identified in these events to uh, help the two industries work together for the reliability of both. Right. 
record. All right, thanks to both of you. You know, it was great. Even in their presentation, they referenced internal controls. So we've got a little bit of a theme going, but uh, I wanna thank everybody for their time today. And uh, in particular, I wanna thank uh, all of the folks uh, from WEC staff who, who've been instrumental in putting this on logistically. There's a lot going on. I mentioned them this morning, but uh, as you can see, I think a lot of things went pretty well today. So if you get a chance to thank them uh, out in the registration area, uh, when you get a chance, please do so. Um, I also want to thank uh, the, the team from NERC who came. Uh, some of them will be making their way back tomorrow. So if, uh, if you want to talk to them about their topics, make sure you do that at the reception. Uh, but uh, a lot of great discussion today. Learn about how busy standards is, and it really is kind of amazing for those who have been following this for, for quite some time. You may recall a, a period about 10 years ago when we thought there wasn't really going to be many more standards development activities. And then grid transformation just started to really ramp up and and uh, we're in a totally different place uh, today. Uh, the small group advisory session, I think, is going to be uh, great. So take advantage of that if and where you can. Uh, the, the oversight planning discussion, uh, I hope you really keyed in on that differentiated experience component. Um, that's, that's been a, a constant conversation that we've been having about, you know, this was in scope for me and this was in scope for this other person. But the reality is, is that the experience and the actions and the interactions that occur might be different for those entities, depending upon what we know about the programs. And the same goes for uh, enforcement and, and the distinctions we make. Uh, it's kind of funny that the enforcement processes have always required that there be controls in place to prevent against future noncompliance before closing out a noncompliance. And so just think about that for a second when you are developing your programs that, uh, you know, it's, it's probably better to have that discussion on the front end and to have them in place to prevent and have that conversation with, with our monitoring staff, uh, even though it's always been part of, of our enforcement process. Um, but with that, I'm going to close up and just remind everybody that the reception will be out there behind us in the, the lobby uh, where, our, uh, where, where our vendors are set up um, and, and other service providers. Uh, and that will be going on for, I think, about two hours. Is that right? We've got a two-hour two hour window, so you can avail yourself of that. And then I will see everybody here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And breakfast, breakfast begins at 8 in the morning at the same location. <laughs>